Happy Thanksgiving again, everybody. <laughs> um, let's, you know, we're going to uh, start this second service in prayer. And um, in the first service, we prayed for the youth. Um, let's just start by giving thanks to God for all his faithfulness. First off, let's thank him that when we pray, that his word says that anything we ask according to his will, he hears, and that which he hears, we have. Um, that's a promise. It's a guarantee. It's the word of him who cannot lie. So I don't know, can't, I don't think there's anything more secure, more guaranteed than that on its own there. So let's just thank you. Father, we thank you that when we pray, you hear us. Lord, I thank you right now that when we come to you, that you hear us, that we are your children, that you have made us your own, that you have bought us with a price, and that you have um, called us to yourself, and that you have made us your children, your sons, your daughters, that you have called us kings and priests unto our God, and that you have made us alive in you, Father. We thank you for these things. I thank you, Father, that we know you, that you've not only made us your, your sons and your daughters, but you have poured out your own spirit into us. You have poured out your spirit. You have poured out yourself into us, O oh God. We praise you. We worship you, Father. We give you honor and glory. There is none like you. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who sees all, the one who knows all. There is nothing hidden from you, Father. You are wise and good and true and strong. You are our protector, our strength, our hope, our peace. You know, as we are getting into this, let's ask, let's ask him, Father, help me to focus on you. Help me to dig in right now. Help me to, you know, even though we just maybe had lunch or whatever, let's zero in. Lord, help us to zero in on you, O oh God. Help us to focus on you, Father. You are the infinite one, O oh God. You are never ending. You are wise. You are awesome in all your ways. And there is infinite that we can receive from you. We can never have everything, oh God. Give us more, oh God. Give us more of the well of life, of the fountain of life, of the, uh, of the river of life, oh God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Father, show us how to pray as we ought to, oh God. Show us how to pray as we ought to. Show us what to pray for. Show us the things, oh Lord, that you would have us pray about, the things that are on your heart, oh God. Align us with you. Let's ask them, Lord, align me with your will. Align my thoughts, align my prayers, align me, align me, align each one of us, align me with your will, O God, align me with your heart, O God, make my heart your heart, O God, in Jesus' name, make my heart what is in your heart, O God, in Jesus' name. Praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. Let's say, Lord, align my family, align everyone in my family, every household here, Father, align us, O God, align us, O God, Lord, make our hearts line up with you, O God. May we truly care about the things that you care about. May we truly desire the things that you desire. May we truly focus on the things that have your attention, O oh God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit. Praise you, Father. We honor you. We bless you. There is none like you. You are awesome. You are good. You are true. Thank you for your presence, Father. Thank you, Father. He's the one who reveals things that only he can reveal. He, he reveals secret things, things that are hidden to the world. He will reveal to us. He will even reveal to us new things that we've never seen before. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. So, we were... <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Father, give us grace to see what we haven't seen before. We, where we are blind, Lord, open our eyes to see. Open our eyes to see, Father. Open our eyes to see. Open our eyes to see, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the first service, we were talking, um, we prayed for the youth, and we were, I had mentioned how, you know, like, the enemy is very much after the youth today, it's very much after the children. Um, the enemy desires to control the children, to have his way and to have the youth, the young adults, to have all people. But he's after the youth, but he's always been after these things. He's always been after humanity. But it's up to 
us as a church that determines how successful he is. When we are not doing what we need to be doing as a body, as a church, the enemy will run rampant. It's the body of Christ on the earth that determines the freedom of the enemy on the earth. It's the kingdom of light that affects how much darkness there is. Darkness is always there. Darkness just disappears when there's light. And darkness, the amount of darkness depends on how much light there is. So when we're in a world where um, it's full of darkness, it's because the light isn't shining enough to dispel that darkness. So, you know, the Word of God tells us that there's days coming that are like the days that we see now. Um, it says in the Word that, like, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the days at the coming of the Son of Man. And um, we know that, it even says in Scripture that if not for the, if, if God had not cut that time short, the, day, the time of the end, that even the elect themselves would be deceived. That's an immense amount of deception. That even God's elect would be deceived if, if those days were not cut short. So these type of things, it's like, so what do we pray in these times then? It's like, what do we pray when, you know, you see the, 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 the prophecies of the word of God and how it talks about these days will one day come. We just pray how, we need, first off, we need to pray and ask God, what is your will? What is your will for this day? And we know his will, or his word tells us his will is that no man perish, but all come to the knowledge of God. So it's not his will for darkness, even though the Bible tells us that these days will happen, it's not his will that the youth be confused, that all the evil that runs rampant in the world um, do so in the way it does. Even though the book of Revelation foretells a lot of these things, that doesn't mean it's his will for these things to happen. And there's a, an interesting thing that happens for um, Jonah. So in a, when you look at the scriptures, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. And he was told to go preach to them and tell them to repent. Jonah didn't want to go because he knew God's mercy. And he said, if I go, I know you're a merciful God. And they'll, you know, if they repent, then you... He actually didn't want to see God's mercy um, be poured out upon Nineveh. Um, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He ran from it. But interestingly enough was that there was a prophecy, there was a word that came to Nineveh, that came through, through Jonah, that basically was saying, either repent or be destroyed. So there's a prophecy saying that you will be destroyed. When Jonah went and preached, Nineveh repented, and the prophecy that came over Nineveh did not come to pass at that time. However, I can't remember how many years later, but I don't know if it was hundreds of years or a few hundreds of years or whatever it was, but Nineveh was eventually destroyed. So the prophecy that was spoken over Nineveh still came to pass, but the generation that repented was able to step out of the judgment. It was able to delay the judgment so that the generation at hand didn't have to incur the judgment. I really believe, you know, you look through the scriptures that Throughout the ages of the New Testament, it has been preached since basically the time of Paul and Peter that Jesus' return is imminent. It's like it's at hand. To the point where believers in that day actually would go on the rooftops and wait, and Paul had to address them because they thought Jesus' return was so at hand that they were waiting on the rooftops for him. But I believe that we as a church can actually affect the prophecies and whether our generation encounters judgment and things that have been prophesied in the Bible. In the same way that Nineveh was able to 
delay the judgment for, for a generation. I believe that we, in certain ways, can delay um, judgment in different ways. And the Bible supports that in many times throughout the Word of God where judgment was passed off until later because um, a generation repented. So it's hard to know again what to pray, but at the, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the fact that God does not desire that any man perish. So I think, let's just take a moment, and let's just pray. Father, may, may we in Winnipeg, let's start with where we are, may we in Winnipeg repent. May people all over Winnipeg repent. We're in a day of darkness, we're in a day of so much evil. But that said, it doesn't mean it's too far gone. If the body of Christ rises up, you know, let's turn to a scripture here. We'll turn to 2 Corinthians 7.14. Did I say Corinthians? I meant Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Sorry, George. 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So this was a time when it says, actually we'll start at verse 12, we'll go back to 12, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven, so he's saying, this is actually just when um, Solomon had constructed the temple, and uh, it says, I have heard your prayer. So Solomon had just prayed over the temple. So Solomon says, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. But, so it goes on, it says, when I shut up heaven, and there is no rain or command, the lo- when I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. So all these things are ha- happening. I would say, so that's a, that's, a, that's a form of judgment. It's a form of um, judgment on the, on, on the earth or on Israel because the people of God have strayed from God's ways. Sounds kind of like what was ha- is happening in our world today. Kinda, sounds kind of like what we're happening in Canada today. It says um, pestilence. What is pestilence? Pestilence is viruses and sicknesses and stuff like that. Talks about locusts. I don't know if you guys have seen like the, the last few years. I've, I've never seen grasshoppers. I've seen maybe not this past year, but the previous year, grasshoppers are crazy. No rain. All these things. Last year we had no rain and we had forest fires all over the place. The point is, is that the earth is groaning and is is is. is God said, "I'll heal you." The, the the earth is broken right now because of the mankind's behavior on the earth. But God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's pray. Let's take a moment and pray and say, Father, may your people across this nation, may we turn from the things where we have joined in with the world, where we begin to think like the world thinks, where we have not been humble, where we've been proud in how we have our jobs or we have our buildings and our whatever, 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 where we have pride, oh God, may we all humble ourselves. Actually, you know what? Before we even do that, let's first start with ourselves right now and let's just repent. Let's say, Father, we repent of all these things that we've done ourselves. Let's start like that. Father, in Jesus' name, Forgive me, O oh God, where I have not been humble. Forgive me, O oh God, where I have not sought your face daily. Forgive me, O oh God, where I have not sought you as I have ought to, where I have not hungered for you as I should hunger for you, Father. Forgive me, Father. Father, where I have done things as the world does them, where I have thought as the world thinks. Father, forgive me, O oh God. Forgive me. Now let's pray and let's say, Father, May the spirit of repentance come upon all your people in the city of Winnipeg. Let's start with Winnipeg. Father, may 
the spirit of repentance come upon your people. Father, may the spirit of humility, O oh God, come upon your people in this city. Father, may the spirit of righteousness and the thirst for righteousness come upon your people in this city, Father. May this, this, your people humble themselves, Father. May we seek your face. The word says that if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So Lord, may your people seek you with all their heart, O oh God. Forgive us for our pride. Now let's expand and say, Father, for the nation of Canada, forgive us. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our wickedness. Forgive us our pride. There's so much pride, so much pride, so much pride. Pride in all the systems, all the systems of man. Pride in our school systems. Pride in our medical systems. Pride in our financial systems. Pride in all these things. And all these things will be brought down. Father, forgive us in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask for forgiveness. Move in your people, Father. Move in our nation, Father. So, Revelation 1, verse 4 to 6 says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, a firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of, over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto his God, or kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So we have been made kings and priests, as we talked about in the first service. We've been made kings and priests to our God. There are certain things that go along with that. These aren't just titles for the sake of being titles, but there's actually certain jobs that the kings and priests had to go about doing. So we're going to look at one of them. Leviticus, uh, we'll turn to Leviticus 6, uh, starting at, I think it's 8, actually. Leviticus 6, verse 8. So we're talking about how God has made us kings and priests. <clears throat> so we'll start at verse 8. And it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, upon the altar, all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen trousers he shall put on his body, and take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on the garments, and carry the ashes outside and camp, outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in, in order on it, and he shall burn it on the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. So this is something that we touched on in the first service, and it's how... The job of the priest here was to keep the fire burning always, every morning to go and put the wood on it. Keep the fire burning every morning. We're going to turn to Acts 2, verse 1. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, the, the, we talked about this in the first service and how the Old Testament was prophesying things that would come in the New Testament. The fire in the temple wasn't just about the law. It was a precursor, a preface of what was to come, the new covenant. And that is that the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Spirit, would be given to man, to be given inside the temple of man. So 
in the Old Testament, the fire burned in the temple or the tabernacle, the physical temple or tabernacle. But in the New Testament, when Jesus came and poured out the Spirit, we are now that temple. Now that fire burns in us. So the job of the priest, what was the job of the priest in Leviticus? The job of the priest in Leviticus was to keep the fire burning. So as priests to God, priests over our own house, priests over our own temples, our job is to keep the fire burning in our own lives. Keep this, the fire of the Spirit burning. Now, I went into more on this in the first service, but we're going to kind of go a different direction now. And the other side of the starting verse that we read in Revelation of God making us kings of priests is we touched on king, uh, our priest, priesthood, but let's look at the actual king's activities. So let's turn to um, Deuteronomy 17. We're going to look at verse Deuteronomy 17. Fourteen. So this is the, the title of this passage called Principles Governing Kings. And this is in the book of Deuteronomy. This is before Israel had a king. So it says, When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. So first off, it was never God's will for Israel to have a king over them. But God knew that Israel would be like, well, I want to be like everyone else. Uh, we want to set a king over them. So in God's wisdom and foreknowledge, he actually set up guidelines ahead of time, saying, when you do this, there are certain things that you're going to need to keep in mind. So it says, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he, shall not, but he shall not multiply horses for himself. Okay, so let's pay attention here. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horse, horses. Well, same point. For the Lord God said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. And nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be that when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So there's three things that God said you shall not do. Let's go to 1 Kings 10. <clears throat> voice, uh, the throat is getting dry for the second service. All right, First Kings 10. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of things here. It says, 
The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold, interesting number, 666 talents of gold. Besides that, from the traveling merchants, from the income of the traders and all the Canaanites of Arabia, and from the governors of the country. What did we just read that God told them not to do? He said, he shall not multiply horses, you shall not multiply wives, you shall not multiply silver. All right, strike one. He just multiplied gold and silver here. The king, and King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, so on and so on. Talks about more gold, talks about his, his great throne of ivory and all his drinking vessels of gold. Let's move along to... Twenty-six, verse twenty-six. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had one thousand four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities with the king at Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars trees as abundant as sycamores. You know, like often we hear of like Solomon's wealth and Israel's wealth in that day, and we like, well, like they were actually like tossing silver like in the streets because there was so much of it. And we think, wow, like God really blessed them. And God did bless them. But the, what, that kind of blessing was never his, his intent. He said, you shall not multiply gold and silver like that. And then it, and he goes and multiplies horses. And it says, and also Solomon had horses imported from Egypt. God had said in Deuteronomy, don't import horses from Egypt. You shall not go back that way. Strike two. And I think we know how strike three happens, right? But King Solomon loved many foreign women. So this is 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, the Hittites, from the nations of whom God, the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor with you, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts away after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Stop there. Actually, we'll read the next one. It says, and he had 700 wives. All right, stop there. Strike three. It's amazing when you see that that command was given, I don't know how many years earlier, maybe 100 years earlier, I don't know, but a um, couple hundred years earlier. It was so specific, and Solomon so specifically broke all those laws. Even to the point where, like, you know, yeah, well, anyway, well, um, so specifically. But what was the main thing, I think, that could have avoided all that? Well, it was the second part of the command, and it says, And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book, from the one before the priests, the Levites. So this is Deuteronomy 17. Um, we're at verse, let's go find this here. Verse 18. So he shall write himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. You know, in, in the first service, and even just now, we were talking about how the priest's job was to daily, every morning, put the wood on. It's like a, a mundane uh, task that, not glamorous of any kind, but it had to be done every day. Here we see a task for the king that literally, if Solomon had actually obeyed this part, we could have seen a completely different turn of events. I don't think he did the second part. I don't think he wrote this out and reviewed it every day. I think if he had done these things, that would have probably been written in his heart. He had good intentions in the beginning. The fire was burning in him, in him so furiously. In the same way that the fire came down and actually engulfed the temple that he was in, the fire was burning in him. It was 
He was very passionate. He was on a fire for the will of God at that point. But the fire burned out. You can see here that actually Solomon functioned in priesthood in a certain way. He actually went, and in Second Chronicles, he was the one who actually prayed the prayer that the priests prayed in Leviticus. So he was actually functioning in a bit of a role of, as a priesthood, just like his father David did. I think from, even from what Matt had just kind of, there was a scripture, what was that scripture reference you read from there, Matt? First Chronicles, okay, let's turn there. First Chronicles 16, and then we're going to wrap up from, from here. First Chronicles 16. Oh, perfect, thank you. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. I think like if there's something God's kind of bringing our attention to this morning, it's the day to day. It's like so often we get caught up in like the bigger picture of things and like the week to week or the month to month. It's like, what are we done this year? What are we doing? What are we going? But what are we doing on the day to day? The day-to-day is what makes the week-to-week and the month-to-month and and so on and so on. The day-to-day is what determines if you're going to go and do what Solomon did or not. Um, One thing that has been on my heart lately and I've I've started to do is I'm writing a family constitution. I mean, it kind of sounds silly. but I'm doing what the Bible tells us here. He says, go write the law and then read it every day. And I'm doing that for our household where I'm writing the law for us. And the law isn't the law in the sense of you get hammered if you, if you break it. But the law is meant to be as a guide. So things like, like my first point is that we will dwell in God always. Every day we will dwell in God. And we will go to him and seek his presence. And I think we need, we need these types of things as, as reminders. And I think we should pay attention to what God is showing us here in the day-to-day activities. So I'd encourage everyone, even if it's just a short little list of just like an, on, an, on your iPhone or whatever, create a list of things that God is speaking to you about that on every day be something that you do, whether it's I'm going to um, give thanks to God every day for something, or I'm going to do this and that and so on. But make a list and then review that list. Go to it. Read it. That we may not stray from these things. It's our job as priests to keep the fire burning. It's our job as kings to continue and not uh, diverge from the law that God has set for us. So let's pray. Let's finish up in praying and say, Father, um, Show us the law that you have for us as individuals. There's going, to be indivi- there's going to be specific things that he has for each one of us. There's going to be more general things that all believers need to do. But let's just ask him to reveal his word to us. Father, we ask you right now that you would reveal your word to us, Father. Lord, if you would have each person here go about and do this same thing where you would have them write the law for their day, for their week, for their month, Father. In the way that you commanded the kings to write the law down, to review it every day, to look at it, to meditate on it, Father. Lord, we ask, Lord God, that you would speak to each one of us the law that you have for us, Father. Give us the diligence. Give us the power. These things are not easy. If there's anything that's not easy, it's doing things day to day. It's easy to work out once, but is it easy to work out day to day to day? It's easy to do things once but it's not easy to do them day to day. Father, help us to do things day to day. Help us to be diligent, Father. Help us to be wise and prudent, Father. Help us, O God. Help us to do what we can't do on our own. Help us to feed the fire of the Spirit in our lives day to day. Help us to study the law that you have for us day to day. 
Lord, we ask for all these things. We thank you, Father, that you hear these things. We thank you, Father, that we have them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, happy Thanksgiving again, everyone. Come on up, Matt.